Praise God, praise God, praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will be glad and rejoice in it. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Welcome to our broadcast. Very, very special broadcast for today. Well, I say that every week, but truly, this one is very special. Special because we have never approached the Bible the way I'm approaching it today. But before I go into the Word, a couple of announcements. Don't forget that we broadcast on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on our Bishop Etiola podcast. All this you can get on the internet. The broadcast has also been aired on RBS TV 13 in the great country of Guyana every Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. local time. And in 23 Caribbean island countries through Mercy and Truth TV in the great country of Jamaica every Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 local time. And every Wednesday too, at 1.30 a.m. That's all local time. We also like to remind you that we're on Logic One TV, channel 112, in the great country of Jamaica, three times a week, and also many, many, many times during the week for our prayer broadcast. I pray that God will bless those of you who watch us on these TV stations and those of you who are watching us right now on the internet. May this prove to be a life-changing experience for you today. May God bless those who own those stations and may God bless the employees also. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this place today. You've given me a word, but without your help, I cannot deliver the word. So as I ask you all the time, I'm asking you one more time, anoint me to speak and anoint your people to listen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen, we continue today our series. Yes, it's a series on how to have a happy, healthy, and successful 2022. You know, one of the best ways to do that is to pay attention to our spiritual lives. And one of the ways to strengthen our spiritual lives is to look at how spiritually successful men and women of God of years gone by lived their lives, studying and learning from the secrets behind their strong spiritual lives will go a long way in helping you and in helping me to be better children of God. You know, Paul the Apostle, he supported such a move when Three times in the New Testament, he made statements that we will begin with on the broadcast of today. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading there in verse number 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now look at verse 16 now. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 1, he repeated the same thing. He said, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And then you go to 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 1, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also 
arm of Christ. In other words, I'm running after Christ, run after me, and we will all be running after the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, in verse 17, it says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us as an example. Again and again, Paul admonishes his followers to pattern their lives after his own. When that is done, ladies and gentlemen, we become as strong and as dynamic in the Lord as Paul the Apostle was. My plan for today is to share with you something special, really special, about a respected man that lived in the New York area. Yes, many, many, many years ago, before any one of us on this broadcast was ever born. Yes, New York area. He was actually born in Connecticut, and he lived there for many years, and he walked here in New York also for the gospel. And believe me, he left a great mark behind for all believers who are discerning. He could easily have made the calls that Paul the Apostle made, be ye followers of me. I'm talking about a man named Jonathan Edwards. Have you ever heard that name? Well, if you haven't, get ready for a journey into the truth as we study the biography of this great man of God, Jonathan Edwards. He was born in the year 1703 in Connecticut, and he died in the year 1753. He lived a very short life, just 53 years. It's not so much how long you live, but how well. You lived your life. And this man surely lived his life for the glory of God and to the benefit of humanity. He never knew when he lived that I would be preaching about him today. I pray that years and years and years and years to come, people will still be talking about you. People will still be talking about me. Not for evil, not for bad, but for good. Jonathan Edwards accomplished more than many people that lived longer than he did. He came from a very large family. His father was a pastor. His grandfather was a pastor too. So he had a pastoral heritage. He was one of the most imposing figures in American theology. He has been described by many as the most acute early American philosopher and the most brilliant of all American theologians. Even with such ability and gifting that God gave him, with such depth in theology that God gave him, Jonathan Edwards maintained a central focus on his pastoral responsibility as well as his personal life. Biographers, they rank Jonathan Edwards very, very high with the likes of John Wesley and other great men of God that walked on this earth. Perhaps the most, that most, most people know about this man was a powerful sermon that he preached, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That The transcript of that sermon is still on the internet till today. Just Google it. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Powerful, powerful, powerful sermon that Jonathan Edward preached many, many years ago. The sermon had so much conviction inside it that sinners in the auditorium when he was preaching it felt like they were literally in the hands of an angry God 
and that they were falling into hell right there and then. Powerful sermon. Some convicting truth. So convicting was that sermon that people ran and held on to the pillars of the building. Yeah. Fearing that they were literally falling into hell as the sermon proceeded. Without a doubt. So many of them committed themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That man was a man whose lifestyle was great and whose lifestyle on our broadcast today is worth studying and is worth patterning our lives after. That is the beauty of character study. I love character study. We have never done it on this broadcast. This is the first time we're looking at the biography of Jonathan Edwards. Of course, you know, the Bible is our primary source of biographical stories. Who can forget the lives of Adam and Eve? Who can forget the lives of Cain and Abel, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Elijah? Elisha, David, Solomon, St. Paul, the list goes on and on. And who can forget the life of Master Jesus himself? So whether it's about Bible characters or characters who lived after the completion of the Bible accounts, there are many, many, many advantages of studying the biographies of saints gone by. Let me share with you some of the many advantages of doing a study, of doing a sermon on the biographies of those who are gone. Number one, biographies teach us real and practical life lessons. You know, basically, in reading a biography, you get to learn about what an individual has been through. Consequently, you can relate with those individuals. But there's another reason. Biographies, they tell and they show us how to deal with certain situations in life, especially when we look at how they dealt with similar situations during their lifetime. Biographical studies also, they give us motivation, continuous motivation to be all we can be in God. In addition to that, you get to hear other people's stories. The inspiration from their stories turn them into our mentors and our role models. But they also allow you to stand on the shoulders of giants and see far into the future. And that's what we're going to do today. Stand on the shoulders of Jonathan Edwards, the man who once lived in this great city called New York, and also in the state of Connecticut. He was a giant. And on his shoulder, we're going to stand today and say how we can be better. Biographies. They remind you that history repeats itself. Yes. Judge Satanyana wrote in 1905, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Reading about the real experiences of others, they give us context for the decisions and the consequences of the decisions that we all make when we do certain things. Another reason why biographies are so good is they promote self-discovery. To be honest with you, reading part of the biography of Jonathan Edwards have really impacted my own life and the little tiny bit of his life that I'm going to share with you today, you will see how powerful the story of Jonathan Edwards was. They promote self-discovery and they also allow you to see the world in new ways. They allow you to see the Christian life and how to live it in new ways. And I think things have been so modernized and have been so messed up 
you will think there are no better ways to live for God. Well, when you look at the life of this man that we're examining today, I believe it's going to challenge you. You know, the good thing about biographies also is that they give you mentors at a distance. You know, many people will say, I want you to be my mentor. I will come to your house every Thursday or come to your office every Wednesday. Well, these are mentors at a distance. And uh, they are a blessing, people. Biographies, they help us gain insight into how successful people handle crises and solved complex problems. They invite us into the lives of these people who we are studying. They allow us to observe these people and see how they grappled with the challenges of life and how they made important decisions. And that will help you. And that will help me also to know how to make decisions in life. In some instances, biographies can stand as a warning. Yes, helping us to know the pitfalls that we should avoid. They open our eyes to the world, allowing us to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. This ultimately leads to greater understanding and better decision making. I hope what you hear today will help you make better decisions to be better Christians. But last but not the least, biographies Ah, the benefit us because you come across the thinking process of the person that you are reading and studying about. You will know the mistakes they made in their lives and then you will plot a path to avoid making the same mistakes. I admonish you to find great people that are alive or dead. Read about them and see what you can learn about their successes and also about their failures. That is exactly what our biographical sermon for today is about the great man of God called Jonathan Edwards. I have titled this sermon The Resolution of Jonathan Edwards. Yes, the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. But I have a problem. The only problem I have is that it is absolutely impossible to focus on all the aspects of the life of Jonathan Edwards in a one-hour sermon. So what I've done is this. I've gone in and searched out just one aspect of his life that really, really helped him to be who he was. One aspect of his life that really helped him to be who he was. You wonder what that was? Jonathan Edwards, over the course of his life, he wrote down seven zero, 70 principles that he lived by. Are you a principled person? You got to guess, you got to have some principles that you live by or else anything will go with you and you'll never be who God really wants you to be. These 70 principles that he lived by were resolutions that he made at one time or another during the course of his life. And he faithfully held on to them and they helped him become the giant that he became in the Lord. Well, don't you think it's worth studying if some principles helped a man to become a giant? I think it's worth our while to just look through them and see how we can inculcate them into our own lives also. Of course, you know there is no way 
I can go through all 70 of them. So what I have done is to extract eight out of the 70 for the purpose of this admonition. So whether you are a preacher like Jonathan Edwards was, or you're just a regular Christian, what I share with you today, ladies and gentlemen, about this man will surely help you as you go on in your journey into 2022. Are you ready? Come with me as I share with you the principles that this man lived by. He wrote them all down. And it began each and every one of them with the word resolved, resolved, resolved. Here is number one, not necessarily in the order in which he wrote it down. I just extracted the eight that I could have enough time to share with you today. Number one, resolved never to do anything which I should despise or think meanly of in another. Wow. I read that and I said, wow. Want me to read it to you again? Never to do anything which I should despise or think of meanly in another. In other words, Jonathan Edwards made up his mind that he will not do anything that he sees others do that turn him off, that turns his stomach, that makes him unhappy. That was the principle that King David failed woefully. You remember King David, all he did to Bathsheba and all he did to the husband of Bathsheba. And then the prophet came along and just told him a little parable. <laughs> Let me read the story to you. And the parable turned the stomach of David and he did not know <coughs> the, king, the, the prophet was actually talking about him. So what he saw in that parable made him very, very unhappy. And, and the prophet said, well, if you feel so bad about this, why don't you feel so bad about what you did? And that's what Jonathan Edwards is telling us. He resolved never to do anything that he will despise if he sees it in other people. In other words, if you don't want to see other people do it, if you will feel unhappy if other people do it, Jonathan Edwards said, I'm not going to be part of it. Second Samuel chapter 12. I'm reading there in verse number one. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and he grew up together with him and with his children. He did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and is spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was common to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now look at the reaction of David. The Bible says that David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Ooh, he saw it in other people, it turned him off, but he did the same thing, but he never saw it. He never saw it. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. And I delivered thee out of the hand of King Saul, and on and on and on and on the story goes. You got the point. You can understand, therefore, the resolve of Jonathan Edwards, 
who resolved never to do what David did, never to do anything which I should despise. Yeah. Before you commit the thing, ask yourself, will I despise this if I see it in another person? If the answer is yes, Jonathan Edwards said, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Unfortunately, David did just that. And you know the rest of the story. Let's go to the second resolution that I extracted from the 70 resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. Number two, he said resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. This guy was deep. Wow. Now read that to you again. Never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. This is truly a resolution that helps the believer to live a holy life on a constant basis. Living every day as if Christ will come that day. Living every hour as if death will come knocking that very hour. Jesus said in the book of Luke, the 12th chapter, in verse 35, Let your loins be guarded about and your lights burning. And ye yourself like unto men that wait for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding, and that when he cometh and knocketh, they will open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known that hour and what hour the thief will come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Look at what Jesus said. Be ye therefore ready for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. And death also can come at an hour when ye think not. Don't you think we should live by this principle in 2022? Never to do anything which we should be afraid to do if it were our last hour in this life. Let me move to another spiritual resolution of Jonathan Edwards. That's number three of the eight resolutions I have with me here. Number three, resolved never to speak evil of anyone so that he shall tend to his dishonor more or less upon no account except for some real good. That's a good question. How many of you have been spoken evil of? I guess everyone that is watching me and hearing me can say yes to that. Uh, evil has been spoken concern. It's, it's the normal evil in the world. Don't join them. Jonathan Edwards said, I'm not going to be part of that foolishness. I think the Bible is really very clear. Very, very clear. And I've preached extensively on this verse, on this broadcast in the past. So I'm not going to talk more, much on this. Here are a couple of scriptures, though, that are connected with evil speaking. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 31, Let all bitterness, and that's where evil, evil speaking comes from. And wrath, that's where evil speaking comes from. And anger. That's where evil speaking comes from. And clamor, 
That's where evil speaking comes from. Where you see bitterness, you are likely to see evil speaking. Where you see wrath and anger, you are likely to see evil speaking. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you, including malice. Get rid of them. In 2022, James chapter 4 verse 11, speak no evil one of another brethren. Wait a minute. That means it's not only the people who are politicians that speak evil of one another. Even brethren saved can speak evil of one another. And judgeth his brother. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Let's get it, people. Jonathan Edwards says, I see it all around me. And it spoils your record before the throne of God. Speak evil of no man. First Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and all envies and all evil speaking. The man of God said, lay it aside. Chapter 3 verse 10 of that same first Peter. For he that will love life aha, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that he speak no guile. How many of us will love life in 2022? How many of us will love to see good days in 2022? The Bible says, watch your tongue. Refrain your lips from speaking evil. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 10. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness, they despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not even afraid to speak evil of dignities. Your president is a dignitary. Your vice president is. Your pastor is. Your pastor's wife is. Please watch your words. It can get you in trouble. Jude repeat the same thing. In verse 8, likewise also these filthy dreamers, they defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Titus rounds it up for us in the third chapter, in the first verse. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. Did you hear that? Speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness, unto all men. Oh, I'm glad God led us to this point to study the life of Jonathan Edwards, a man who said, I don't get involved in it. If an evil speaker comes knocking on my door, I'll get out through the back door. Why don't you make up your mind this year? Even if those people are evil, leave it to God. All right? If they did something wrong, you have malice towards them and you're angry and you are bitter, just just quit and don't start talking because you can get in trouble for the misuse of your words. Resolution number four. Jonathan Edwards said, I resolved frequently to renew the dedication of myself to God. Yeah. When I read this, I just said, wow, these people really were deep. He said, I resolve to frequently, in other words, from time to time, renew the dedication of myself to God Almighty. That is a powerful, powerful principle to live by indeed. To frequently renew our individual dedication to God should be our pursuit. In 2022, 
just like husbands and wives tell each other, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, over and over again. You know, I've even seen couples that renew their marriage vows in their churches from time to time. They just put on their wedding dress all over again, have their children with them and go before the altar. Say, what are you doing here? We just want to renew our vows. That's what Jonathan Edwards said. I just want to renew my dedication to God from time to time and let him know like we sing in that song, I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I'm not, I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. That was what a king did in Second Kings chapter 23, in verse 1. And the king said, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah. Don't you think we need to do this in our churches one Sunday? Where we gather the whole church together and we let them say some words that show that they are renewing their dedication to the Almighty. Wow. And the king said, they gathered all the elders of Judah and all the elders of Jerusalem. And the king went into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. Can you imagine? The whole city came with him and the priests and the prophets. Oh, wow. And all the people. Did you hear that? The priests, the prophets, the pastors, the evangelists and whatever your title is and the People of God, both small and great, and the head of their ears, all the words. He read all the words of the book of the covenant in their ears because they found that book in the temple. And look at what the king did. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. They made a covenant. What was the covenant was? was for to walk after the Lord and to keep his testimonies and his statutes with all their hearts and with all their souls to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. That's what we need to do in our churches. Push aside praise and worship. Push, push aside the dancing, push aside the prophetic, push aside every other thing and call it solemn assembly and say next Sunday we're just going to renew our dedication to God and that includes all the pastors, all the evangelists, all the prophets, all the bishops and all the archbishops. We all come before God, maybe declared as a day of fasting and praying and renew our consecration and renew our dedication to God and get up and run on for the Lord. Let's join them. Let's join the likes of John Edwards. Let's join the likes of Josiah and the children of Israel resolving to frequently renew the dedication of ourselves to God. Number five. Here was the fifth resolution of Jonathan Edwards. And I, I'm telling you, this is not just something he made one January or one February. These were 70 resolutions he made uh, over time when he lived in the New York area. Number five, I resolved to study the scriptures so steadily, so constantly, and so frequently as that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. I feel like reading that again. Don't you feel like hearing that again? I resolve to study the scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently so that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. There are two points here I must bring out. Number one, it's one thing to resolve to read. It's another thing to resolve to study. I think we do more reading than studying. 
But God wants us to do reading and he wants us to do studying also. The other point here are the key words of this resolution. It has to do with studying the scriptures. He said, I want to study the scriptures steadily. I want to study the scriptures constantly. I want to study the scriptures frequently. Those three words say the same thing. Don't go on a French leave from the word of God. Let it be known that you study the word of God on a constant basis. Look at what some people said about studying the Bible. D.L. Moody. He said, merely reading the Bible is no use at all without studying it thoroughly. Hunt it through as it was some great truth. And that's what it is. Dear Moody also said, I never saw a useful Christian who was not a student of the Bible. These people can talk. Another man said the Bible is the greatest of all books. To study it is the noblest of all pursuits. To understand it is the highest of all goals in life. Beautiful. Another person said Bible study is the most essential ingredient in the believer's spiritual life because it is only in studying the Bible as it is that we are blessed by God and we discover what it means to follow him. Let me show you one more thing that another person said. He that will be conformed to the image of Jesus and become Christ-like must be constantly studying Christ himself. Wow. Look at these scriptures. Essential scriptures. Ezra chapter 7 in verse number 10. I love this scripture. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Did you see the progression? Law of the Lord, seek it. Law of the Lord, do it. Law of the Lord, do it teach it. There are people that just take the law of the Lord and start teaching it. They have not read it. They have not studied it. They have not practiced it. You can't just be a preacher of the word without being a doer of the word. That's essentially uh, what we are being taught here. And the man of God said, I just want to spend time in the word. Can I ask you a question? Let me not even ask you that question. Let me just challenge you. Do more Bible reading in 2022 and do more Bible studying in 2022. Do they have Bible study in your church? If they don't, we have Bible study online. Every Wednesday at 7 p.m. New York time. Blessed time. Wholesome truth. You can join us and you will be blessed. Psalm 119 in verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. <laughs> Did you see that? I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimony as much as in all riches. Some people will rather rejoice in riches than rejoice in the testimonies of God. Some people will rather throw away the Bible so they can grab riches. But this man said, I'm balanced. I love the Bible. I love riches. And one does not suffer because of the other. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes and I will not forget thy Lord and thy word rather. J Joshua, beautiful scripture. And I'm sure you know it as much as I do. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want to have good success in 2022? You want to make your way prosperous in 2022? Dive into the Word. Read the Word. Practice the Word. Success is in there for you. 
Let's all resolve to join Jonathan Edwards to study the scripture so steadily, so constantly, and so frequently as that we may find it and plainly perceive ourselves to grow in the knowledge of the same. Let's move to resolution number six. Jonathan Edwards said, resolved never henceforth till I die. Now this got to be deep. Resolved never henceforth till I die to act as if I were in any way my own, but entirely and altogether God's. Wow. Powerful. Very powerful principle that is worth living by. It ties in with the admonition of Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. Jonathan Edwards said, I will never live as if I belong to myself. And then in 1 Corinthians 3.23, Paul the Apostle said, And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. 2 Corinthians 5.15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Psalm 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Isaiah caps it. In chapter 43 and verse 21, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. What a beautiful, beautiful resolution. I will not live my life as if I belong to myself. I belong to God. And that's what makes us go to preach sometimes. Sometimes you go to preach and you don't feel too good in your body. But you still go and you say, I have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. You stand behind the pulpit and strength comes from nowhere. My friends, you are not yourself. Don't put your hand in what God will not put his hand in. Don't put your mouth in what God will not put his mouth in. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You are not your own. Resolution number seven. Resolved. To be strictly and firmly faithful to my trust. That that in Proverbs 26, a faithful man who can find may not be partly fulfilled in me. This guy, this guy, Jonathan Edwards. I want to see you when we get to heaven. And if possible, have my own little uh, place to live beside yours. This is a beautiful resolution. To be strictly and firmly faithful to my trust that Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6 which says a faithful man who can find may not be partly fulfilled in me. In other words, when they are looking for faithful people that they say are scarce commodities, they will find faithfulness in me. Wow! You know, there are many things that are entrusted to us by man and by God. Jonathan Edwards resolved that he will be known by his faithfulness. Others may choose to be unfaithful and undependable. He resolved that he will not be one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the scarcity of faithful men and women is a problem we see all around us. Employers see it in their employees. Citizens see it in their elected officials. Church members see it in their church officials. The psalmist himself wrote in Psalm 12, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, and the faithful fail from among the children of God. <sighs> God can help us. That is what makes me happy. He can help us to stand out in this world that is filled with unfaithful people. We can stand out as faithful men and faithful women of God. 
whatever we are called upon to do, faithfulness is the key. Let's resolve, like Jonathan Edwards, to be strictly and firmly faithful to our trust. The Proverbs 26, a faithful man who can find may not be partly fulfilled in us. I wish we had time for 20 more resolutions of John Jonathan Edwards, but I got time for one more at least. That takes me to number eight. Jonathan Edwards said, let there be something of benevolence in all that I speak. Wow. Let there be something of benevolence in every word that proceeds out of my mouth. What is benevolence? That's, that grammar is too big for me. I looked in the English dictionary. Benevolence simply means the quality of being well-meaning, the quality of kindness. What Jonathan Edward means then, what is seen by this life principle, is really very simple. To let the words of his mouth have the quality of well-being that ministers grace and kindness to those that hear him. You know, we all speak thousands of words every day. Men speak about 20,000. Women speak about 30,000 words every day. And we speak these words in the presence of different kinds of people. How wonderful, how wonderful will it be if the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts are always acceptable unto the Lord God. Look at what Colossians says in chapter 4, in verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Wow. Are your words seasoned with salt or are they seasoned with vinegar? Or are they seasoned with pepper? I will talk to you, you will have a headache, some people will say. But Jonathan Edwards said, I just want to talk as if salt is in my mouth. Great benevolence, great kindness, great gentleness in the words that I speak. Proverbs chapter 10, in verse 21. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. Chapter 15, verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach of the spirit. Proverbs 15, 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Proverbs chapter 18, in verse number 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now Jonathan Edwards said the words that come out of my mouth will bring with it kindness, upliftment, and goodness that those who hear it may be impacted positively by it. How's your tongue? How are your words? Do people avoid you because of the way you talk? Because of the way you address people? It's time for a change. James chapter 3 verse 5, and even so the tongue is a little member, boasteth many great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And then he says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, and it defileth the whole body, and it setteth on fire the course of nature, and it set on fire of hell himself. Wow. How do you use your tongue? How can you use your tongue the way you do and still be able to prophesy and still be able to preach? What a contradiction. And the Lord help us to use our tongues right. 
that Jonathan Edwards resolved to do. The funny thing is that the good thing, it's not even funny, the good thing and the great thing is that everything he resolved to do, he did them. I wish we had more time to examine the remaining 62 life principle resolutions that made Jonathan Edwards a great man that he was. But I think we have looked at enough to build on a very successful 2022. We can never regret following the examples of this man. Mm -mm. If we commit ourselves to live by these principles, our lives will never remain the same. What are the resolutions again? Resolve never to do anything which I should despise or think meanly in another. Resolved never to do anything that I will be afraid of to do if it were my last hour in life. Resolved never to speak evil of anyone. Resolved to frequently renew the dedication of myself to God. Resolved to study the scriptures steadily, constantly, and frequently. Resolved never henceforth till I die to ask, to act as if I were any way my own, but entirely and altogether God's. Number seven, resolved to strictly and firmly be faithful to whatever is committed into my hand. And lastly, that words of my mouth will be words of benevolence. Can I pray for you as we close? Heavenly Father, I pray for myself first of all. And I pray for all the men and women that are watching me right now. Please help us to live by these great principles that our lives may be positively impacted by them. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for watching us. Until next week, Bishop, saying to you, have a good week. Bye-bye.